okay, so say there's excitement about NFTs, right? Um, it's, uh, I think the most exciting and the biggest sales that have happened in the space are because things are rare. They're one of one or they're one of five, right? And so people are like, ooh, I want that because it's not going to be able to be replicated. This will belong to me. And I'm one of only, I'm the only person who has it, or I'm one of only five people that has it, you know, and there's exclusivity attached to it, yes. which is something that you can tap into Without giving a bleep about NFTs. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to the Creative Juice Podcast. I am your host, Corinne Campbell, and today we're going to talk all about NFTs. Psych! Gasp. <laughs> Jack, Jack was about to die just now. <laughs> Pit in stomach, heart sank, eyes rolled back, <laughs> you name it, all the things, all the reactions just happened to me over here. <laughs> Dude, it's crazy. This buzz is crazy and we have to address it, right? You guys know us. We have hard opinions and we're happy to share them. I mean... <sighs> Well, I want to get, I'm probably more uh, flexible on this topic. So Jack, why don't you first give me your opinion about the buzz of NFTs? Yeah, for sure. Now, I might temper down uh, some of my rhetoric that, that you and I have had in conversation. <laughs> uh, well, thank goodness for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do have some thoughts on... Uh, on the buzz around NFTs. And, you know, we're going to get into just like selling uh, in general in uh, in this episode, which I think is going to be really fun and shed some light on why uh, I think both of us hold some of the opinions that we do about this buzz. Now, I don't have any real issues with NFTs as a whole. I actually think it's really, really cool. Um, I think the topic is neat. I think the evolution of blockchain and how it's affecting currency and how it's affecting uh, exchange of goods, how it, how it could potentially affect uh, things like intellectual property. I think all of that is really, really cool. And I think there's a neat future in it. Uh, however, I have a bone to pick with the buzz around it because I think a lot of the rhetoric that's thrown around is like, you know, very much like right now, this is the new thing. Uh, every artist in the world, every creative in the world needs to pay attention to this. And uh, <laughs> the reason that uh, I don't like that is because I think it's a big old shiny object syndrome that's distracting a lot of people that really aren't even in a place to worry or think about this topic, to worry and think about this topic. Um Right. So that's kind of like point number one is like, if you've never sold anything or you're in the process of learning how to create offers and, you know, you're putting together a catalog of products and you're building merch ideas and really just getting your feet wet as an artist or a band and you're figuring out how to monetize your fan base and get people buying what you have to sell, well then... The topic of NFTs isn't really where you need to be spending a whole lot of your mental energy or your focus. You need to be focused on how am I going to, you know, sell to people for the very first time? How am I going to create offers that are really, really badass? Um, and frankly, like anything that's not that, it's just going to distract you. So uh, that's my kind of point number one. Point number two is like, I just think like mass consumer consciousness isn't there yet. You know, outside of like crypto nerddom, uh, <laughs> I don't think that, uh -huh. you know, uh, the vast majority of a, of a market is going to be flooding to buy your NFT digital product. So that's where uh, some of my thoughts lie on, uh, on the buzz. That's why I think we should, you know, try to ignore the buzz where you can. Like get educated for sure. Like be excited about it. I think there's a future in it, but don't spend a lot of your time spinning your wheels and losing focus on the things that matter. This is no different than any other shiny object to me, um, at least for a lot of people. Right. Yeah, I think something to be considered, you know, people are like, oh, Blau, like he, you know, put this thing up and sold it for all these figures, you know? And 
I mean, something that Blau did that was really smart. I mean, he was campaigning on this way before it became this huge thing. Like he's been working on this for, I think it was like almost a year. And he was getting a lot of the whales in the crypto art space yeah. specifically yeah. invested in this, you know? Um, so that's very different. This was not something that his fans went out and bum rushed and competed with each other to get. I mean, it's possible that there were some of these whales that were fans, you know? Um, but this is very similar to like when someone's like, oh, there's, you know, Litecoin is going to blow up and somebody goes and puts all their money on Litecoin you know? Yeah. And then the coin maybe blows up and maybe it doesn't, or maybe it blows up and then it cycles back down or whatever, you know, it's, it's really experimental, but, um, this wasn't a thing where he rallied his fans and his fans gathered around it, you know, yeah. the, the people who won, you know, this auction or like the Beeple auction, which, you know, went for millions and millions and millions, mil, mil, millions, um, or, you know, the sex tape that Azealia Banks put out, which apparently they're trying to set it at 260 million, I think it is. Like, this stuff is not normal, you know? And it's very, I, it's funny because I draw this very soft line between crowdfunding and NFTs, which is that you can run a crowdfunding trust, you know, and your family and friends might get into it. But if you don't have a base, like there's not going to be this rush, you know what I mean? And um, this, the same thing is true with NFTs, like thinking that you can just put something up, you know, I was in a clubhouse room and, and Paris Hilton was in there and she's like, I'm just going to take like a picture of my dogs and tokenize that and then sell it. And it's like, okay, you're kind of defeating the purpose here. Uh, this is a money grab, you know? And really, if you look at artists who have been doing NFTs for a while, like, you know, Dead Mouse, which <laughs> he's just one of my go-tos uh, to talk about this, you know, he's been doing this for a long time. Like he hasn't been doing this for the last month. You know, this has been, I think he's been in for like two years, you yeah. know? Um, and, you know, they see the creation process that goes into making a valuable piece of art and then the conversation that needs to be had about what this value is going to be, right? Um, so my thoughts on it are, you know, that there's there's something, there's got to be a reasonability to this. Um, you know, Bitcoin's going through the roof. Everybody's buying a bunch of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has done this several times where it cycles up and then cycles back down. And maybe doesn't go back to where it started, right? It's still an increase over time. But there's a lot of up and down, right? And when I hear indie artists talking about, oh, I'm going to release all of this on NFTs, it's or like mint all of these tokens and sell stuff that way. It's like, look, are, are you like emailing your people every two weeks? Are you running campaigns <laughs> for traffic on your site? Do you have dynamic, you know, e-commerce retargeting happening? If not, do that first, you know, uh, because there's so many things that just need to be in front of this. So, you know, if you're an artist who has done all of the things, you're doing all of them very, very well. And there's a, a big old fan base and you want to dive into this, like, you know, maybe, okay, but um, I'm not. And I have a healthy customer base and great tech setup, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I, I'm confident in my infrastructure and I still have more to do there before I'm going to rush out for this. So, um, that all that said, I think the reason first off, like I wanted to put that out there because this is a conversation and people are asking about it in the Indies group. And I think, Jack, you've even had some IndieX applications come in with it. Yeah. Um, and so it's something that needs to be addressed. But at the same time, it's like, look, all of these other things you need to be doing first, which we talk about on this podcast all the time. Let's take a look at why you know, doing something like this could be cool, just not in the NFT space. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, or or not necessarily needing to be in the NFT space. Um, right. Like, how do you, but okay, so say there's excitement about NFTs, right? Um, it's, uh, I think the most exciting and the biggest sales that have happened in the space are because things are rare. They're one of one or they're one of five, right? And so people are like, ooh, I want that because it's not going to be able to be replicated. This will belong to me. And I'm one of only, I'm the only person who has it, or I'm one of only five people that has it, you know, and there's exclusivity attached to it, yes. which is something that you can tap into without giving a bleep about NFTs. Um, and so I wanted to pivot the episode today with Jack's insight to talk about how to tap into that excitement, that scarcity, that exclusivity that can, you know, translate to your fans who may not be in, you know, totally understand, you know, cryptocurrency, let alone blockchain and NFTs and what the value of that would be to them. So um, there's a lot of ways that we can, you know, go about this, but I know Jack, you've got kind of a list and I have one. So why don't you start us off? Yeah. Well, so this is great. Like, I think the conversation around NFTs, like you said, does kind of naturally lead us into a discussion about uh, sales and selling and the framework of selling. And one big uh, facet of creating a really, really compelling offer is scarcity. Um, it works really well psychologically. Scarcity, including scarcity in your offer, works really well psychologically to get people to take action because simply put, Nobody wants to feel like they're missing out on something. Uh, and right. you know, there's a lot of different forms of scarcity. Like you said, uh, rarity, you know, one of one, one of five, one of 20, whatever it might be. Uh, having that, having that rarity kind of scarcity is one type exclusivity, um, excluding a certain, it, it, you know, making an offer exclusive to a subset of people. So that might be your, you know, your highest tier customers, your customers with the highest right. LTV or, or people that are in your membership site or your Patreon, um, that kind of exclusivity. Uh, certainly urgency is a, is a kind of scarcity as well. You know, time limited offers. Um, that's another type of scarcity that, that can be used to drive uh, sales successfully. And then excess demand is another one, you know, like, uh, and this is, uh, if, if you see a, a gold rush of, of people coming in, uh, <laughs> speaking of gold rushes, <laughs> if you see a gold rush of demand from your fan base around a particular product, that kind of social pressure ar around the rest, around the rest of your fan base essentially creates a, a sense of scarcity as well. It's like, Oh, well crowd psychology kicks in. Everybody else is doing it. So I don't want to miss out. Um, right. those are kind of like four touch points of, of scarcity, uh, that you can use in you're selling no matter what your offer is. So I wanted to just kick things off just to kind of give some simple definitions on, on those sort of four, and then we can talk about them and unpack them more. Um, but we use these in, uh, in offers for all sorts of artists, all sorts of creatives, um, on all sorts of selling channels, you know, whether it be an online store or a membership site and everything in between, um, for all sorts of products from physical products to soft goods to, uh, digital products, uh, you name it. These, these are principles that, you know, this kind of scarcity is a principle of selling. Um, and if you can put this in your back pocket as a skill that you learn and, uh, learn how to effectively communicate this to your fans in a way that feels authentic, then you're going to have, you know, a leg up on a lot of folks. Uh, even, you know, let's say down the line, NFTs are the thing and, you know, mass consumption is, is gotten to the point where that's what people do. Well, if you know how to sell and you know how to cra craft a really, really cool offer, then you're going to have a leg up. <laughs> so absolutely, whether NFTs yeah, are explaining the value of that exclusivity. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like that knowing how to communicate that to people is essential when you're going, especially if you're starting to move into higher value items, uh, because you have to, you can't just be like, Hey, yo, this hoodie, it's tight, pay $125 for it. You know, yeah. like that doesn't work. You have to be like, no, this is made from llamas and the mountains of whatever. And I hand sewed whatever, you know, like you have to be able to say why this is worth 
what they're paying for it, you yeah. know? And, and that's what we say about CDs, you know, is like a CD is worth what you say it's worth. If yeah. you say nobody uses CDs anymore, I don't even have a CD player, so I'm not going to put them up. You know, well then, yeah, it's not very valuable. Yeah, that's as good like, as a no. co- that's as good as a coaster, <laughs> right? Except, yeah, if you say that, that's how much it's worth. Why is Bitcoin worth anything? Why is an NFT worth anything? Because people say it is, right? They make some kind of selling point. So you have to learn how to communicate to the consumer what is worth it. You know, um, and it, before you get into the NFT space of doing it. How well do you explain the value of something that you made with your own hands or something that's on your merch store? If you can't do that, definitely not going to get past that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, that's one thing that I, so we talked about this, I think maybe it was about nine months ago. I ran an auction in like July or August, maybe. Yeah. Um, sounds about right. Yeah. And I ran an auction on a CD that was just, in a wallet, right? It had army branding on it because this was something that was left over. Um, I maybe took a handful of them when I left just as, you know, memorabilia. And uh, it has all the same music on it of CDs that are currently available. There's nothing that that has been otherwise unreleased, right? And everything's been out. Um, the only thing that's different is that there's artwork and it has the army logo on it. You know what I mean? Um, and so I put one up for auction and it was, so it was literally a CD in a wallet, not even fancy packaging, right? One of those little silicone wristbands, um, that said the name of the army named band, which was called Dash 10, and it has Go Army on the other side, and then a, a sticker from that time, which I've got way too many of that I'm never going to use. So um, I was like, all right, well, I've got these leftover things. I'll put it up for auction. And it sold for $116. If you missed that episode, I'm not sure what episode that was, but go back there. Like there was- We'll find it. it. We'll find it. We'll put it in the show notes. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. Jack's always good about that stuff. Um, But that, you know, that's ridiculous. Like the the CD wallet probably cost the army. I mean, we ordered so, we ordered a quarter of a million of those. So I'm sure they cost like 35 cents or something. The wristbands, same diff. We had so many of them. We got them for pennies. And then the stickers were maybe a penny, you know? Um, And I didn't even pay for it, but I'm just saying, you know, that's a total cost of goods of three bucks or something at the very, very most, you know? And it sold for 116. And it's because I said, look, there's only three of these that aren't, out there and destroyed or damaged or whatever. Like these three are in mint condition and they're the only three I have left. And I'm going to put one of them up now. And it sold for 116. So it's really just about having that kind of limited vibe to it. Um, and auctions can be very exciting that way. I mean, I don't know if you've ever spent time on eBay. Oh yeah. But in the last five, ten minutes of an of an eBay auction, oh, it, gets, it wild. gets spicy. Yeah. yeah. People are excited. They want to win that. And sometimes it's just that they get competitive. It's not even that they want it that much. Like some people are just like, I'm gonna beat this guy. He's been outbidding me. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's something else that, you know, makes this valuable. So Jack, if you were to run an auction for a client, firstly, what kind of products do you think work well, especially if you don't have a super, like say you're working with a grassroots artist, what kind of product do you think would work for that? And B, um, or two, whichever I started with, uh, <laughs> what what kind of tools have you used uh, tech stack wise to get that kind of running in and implemented? Yeah, great question. So, I mean, a lot of this really depends on depends on the artist. For a grassroots artist, like auctions are, I think, challenging, honestly. Like I don't, yeah. uh, it wouldn't be the first thing that I would do. Let me put that out there straight up. Um, if you're a grassroots artist, let's just say this, like if you're a grassroots artist and you're thinking about running an auction, uh, 
make sure you have some customers first. This wouldn't be the first thing. This wouldn't be my first customer acquisition play. Oh, for sure. That I would yeah, run, yeah, that I would totally. run, that I would run for really any artist. Um, but what I would look to do is, um, I would look to, uh, if you're an artist that's grassroots and you've got, uh, a back catalog, especially if you've got like a storied history, um, whether it's with one artist project or another, or, you know, multiple bands that go back, you know, over the years, I would look towards, uh, you know, things like, like you, like in your situation, Corinne, where you had a CD, uh, a, a version of a CD that was branded by the army that, you know, the music's out there on other, other editions, but this is something that people can't get anywhere else. I would look towards something like that, uh, mm -hmm. kind of, for, kind of first and foremost, like legacy collector's item type things that are like, if you are, you know, in my diehard sort of core, um, those are going to be the types of people that would want it. Um, that's, that's what I would aim towards. So you think about things like, um, it might be like leftover shirts from your first ever tour, you know, the first tour you ever did, like maybe you've got a, maybe you've got like a tour t-shirt or something like that with the dates on it, or even like a tour flyer signed. I think these sort of things, uh, I think these sort of things do well when there's a, you know, a personalization element to them when possible that doesn't like destroy the mint condition, but, uh, right. Having that sort of personalized flair on it, uh, from, from you as an artist can be really cool as well. And just add on, you know, stack on value. Um, but I would say it has to be things that are, are items that are actually scarce, actually rare. It can't be false scarcity or, or fake rarity. Um, it has to actually be, you know, truly limited edition in my opinion. Um, and you have to say so, <laughs> um, nah. talking about like talking about the, before we even get into like the tech of it, talking about like just the messaging of it, like you have to let people know, basically like run down it, it's really like a benefit more than it is a feature um the fact that something that you're offering is as rare as it is and then i would i would work to do what you did also like bundle in some additional items with it um that are either equally rare or uh have an element of of that kind of scarcity to it as well so those are you know just a few things that, that I would consider. I, I don't think it necessarily has to boil down to one kind of product. Uh, that kind of rarity works really well. And then I also think just like handcrafted items can work really well, especially if you're, you know, out sort of outside of the, the grassroots realm. Uh, maybe you've got like a, a customer base that's growing and a fan base that's, you know, kind of continuing to expand uh, as you go. I think handcrafted things that, uh, fans might want because they know that you put your time and effort into making it and are also rare. Um, so think about like cut and sew style merch, um, that kind of stuff I think can work really well. Um, almost because it has a designer element to it. I think those can work really well for auction. Um, especially when they're paired with, uh, especially when they're paired with, uh, other kind of rare items or, you know, maybe an exclusive, uh, an exclusive bonus to go along with it. Even something like a certificate of authenticity. Um, you know, you can put together something like that really, really easily. Um, mm -hmm. I think all of that kind of stuff are just like nice bonuses to have. Um, we were talking, uh, two days ago, was it with, uh, one of our technicians at Indie X, Shay, and she was showing us this guitar amp that she just bought. And she was all jazzed up about the fact that, uh, it had come with a pretty dope, like handwritten, like, uh, certificate of, you know, build. And I thought that was pretty cool. Cause I've gotten plenty of like, you know, this is a Fender guitar with the serial number, you know, that comes in the case when you buy it. Like I've gotten that kind of stuff too, <laughs> but hers looked right. like a, a dope, like college diploma. <laughs> and I thought yeah. that was, I thought that was really cool. And this wasn't even an auction item. This was just something, a piece of gear that she bought. But the fact that like that, uh, had that kind of impact on her as a, as a customer, the same kind of thing can apply in an auction scenario, if not more. Um, so those are a right. few things that from an offer perspective, those are a few things that come to my mind. I also think from a tech stack perspective, uh, not so much about the actual, uh, auction platform, but something that I think is really cool with this is actually holding, like holding an auction, uh, 
you know, or or at least like holding uh, an event around this. So like, you know, live streaming the process of doing it, hang out with your fans while it's happening, you know, um, go live, talk about it, have a, have a, whatever, whatever platform you'd like to live stream on, whether it's Facebook live or IG or Twitch, um, you could really do it anywhere and make it fun, make it an event, let there be, you know, chatter and communication going on, uh, treat it almost like a telethon or, a you know, um, yeah. those sorts of things I think can be, can be really, really cool from the marketing aspect of it. Uh, I would encourage, especially if you're, you know, at the grassroots stage and you're needing to hype people up about it. I think just like I would encourage for people who try to do crowdfunding is to make it fun and experiential. You need to do the same here, you know, because you can't le- you're not able to lean on your, uh, stardom or a massive fan base to get you, you know, from point A to point B, uh, you got to do some more work. Right. And that real time communication in the final, you know, whether it's minutes or the final hour or whatever it is, is it like that you need that real time calm, right? Yeah. Like you want to make sure that they're getting things in a timely fashion, like emailing people, you know, in the last hour of an auction, that's eh, not going to, you know, a lot of people won't even get it right away. Um, they might not get it till after it's closed, you know? Yeah. So even if, and even if you've emailed them before about the auction, you're like, well, they would have, if they wanted to be involved, they would have done it. It's like, well, so, I mean, I think that's a great idea. I think live streaming or, you know, having some kind of real time thing. I mean, you could go live on YouTube or, or whatever, or multi stream it, you know, um, at using, you know, something like Restream or something like that and actually project it to multiple platforms and show the screen, you know, and yeah. be like, all right, we're going to refresh, you know what I mean? Yeah, for um, sure. And see, you know, see who's winning right now. Um, having that kind of conversation real time is also likely to like spur a bunch of activity that of people that may not have participated otherwise, or maybe, you know, maybe they put their email in wrong and you haven't been able to email them, or maybe they just didn't realize it because their inbox is too full, you know? So supporting it in that way can also be really advantageous. And, you know, that's true of whether it's an auction or whether it's, you know, one of your exclusive items. Uh, If you, you know, weren't going to do an auction, but you had five things and you have a fixed price on them, um, you know, basically saying like, hey guys, this is live right now. There's only five of them. Um, you know, and, and kind of communicating like, Oh, one's gone, (laughs) you know, uh, stuff like that can really kind of, you know, and that's where we start getting into scarcity, right? So moving from auctions into more of these scarcity limited edition kind of conversations, Jack, do you want to kind of expand upon that? Yeah, sure. So just to kick it off, like I want to put it out there that I think, artists, musicians, creatives are actually like really strongly poised to use scarcity plays and exclusivity plays, really any kind of uh, sales tactic in this realm when it comes to the offers that they make because of who we are. Um, Because when, you know, when a fan picks up something from you, uh, it's not a commodity, you know, they're not buying, right. uh, I don't know, they're not buying toothbrushes or uh, combs. <laughs> they might be, yeah, but they're they, probably more expensive than regular toothbrushes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not, you know, like these, like you don't see like limited edition toothbrushes like advertised at Acme. <laughs> right. Um, it's not utilitarian. Yeah, if they yeah. wanted to get just the utility of it, they probably wouldn't buy it from you. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I think because the, so many of the offers that we aim to make as creatives are speaking to a customer, a fan who hopefully when, you know, they're made an offer feels like it's something that speaks to who they are as a person. You know, uh, this is a part of my existence. This, you know, this is, this is what makes me who I am. This is what binds me to uh, the tribe of people that I'm, you know, surrounding myself with. If that's what you're doing with your merch and you should be, um, that really like tees you up to play into things like exclusivity, exclusivity, um, you know, rare limited edition offers, uh, time-based urgency and the kind of crowd psychology that comes with all of these. Um, I wanted to just put that out there to start to be like, 
you can play into these things just, I, I think, naturally as a function of having a fan base, people who, you know, feel tied to you because of the music that you make and the, and the brand that you've built and the message that you share. Um, your music has an impact on them. And because of that, the product offers, the sales offers that you make, uh, likely already tilt them in the, in the direction of being like, I got to have this because it, you know, it's important to me. Um, and it's not just important to me because I need to brush my teeth or take a shower, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's a, it's a cool conversation to have with people too, because uh, everything that we do really needs to be an opportunity for people to learn more about the artistry, right? Because every new thing that they learn or every new thing that they invest in, they start to feel like they're a part of this with you. And that's essential because there's not, I mean, sorry, but there's nothing so special about your music that that would be enough. You yeah. know, there just isn't. And so it's you as a person and your journey as an artist and, you know, all of the things that have inspired you to continue on to this moment. And so if you can have that conversation with people and translate that to, then I poured it into this with, you know, this story, um, you know, that makes them feel like a part of your whole journey. And that really cements their ownership in you in the future too. So these kinds of things are just, you know, a really great way to, you know, make some money, but also deepen their care about you as an artist and deepen that relationship. Totally. Yeah. That's, that's exactly it. Um, so I think there's, you know, so many, there's just a wealth of things that we could unpack about, about these kind of selling concepts. Um, but I think what I would encourage people to do is just start looking into ways that you can tap into them. Um, a lot of artists that we work with, uh, at Indie X, for example, will use, uh, rarity type scarcity, you know, limited edition, um, or, you know, only this many available as regular product offers, you know, regular merch drops, they're often called, um, mm -hmm. to monetize their fan base and to get people excited and to give them something, you know, give them a regular kind of cadence of sales offers of, of new things that, you know, fans who really want to be involved, they want to have items that are, you know, essentially become collector's editions. Um, so, I mean, just, right. just talking about the fact that like, you know, we only have 50 of these shirts. Um, that's just one example. Uh, we only have a hundred of these CDs is just another example. Something else that works really, really well is along with that. Um, and actually there's a, one of our IndieX clients who they do like a shirt of the month style, uh, campaign every month, um, which is really cool, uh, in and of itself. Um, you know, they, they do like a limited run and, uh, and pretty much sell them out every month, which is cool. But in addition to it, they also recently have been doing, uh, an upsell along with that, which is usually a second t-shirt with a different design, uh, that kind of falls under this collector's edition. And those are all numbered. So, uh, each of the shirts actually has a, a number on it. And, uh, wow. those are, those are even more scarce and, yeah. uh, to, to top that off, not only are they like scarce in number, they're also scarce in time. It's like, we've got this many of them. It's going for two weeks. And then once they're gone, like goodbye forever. <laughs> so right. you, can, you can lump these elements onto each other and, uh, and really, really make it, you know, make your offers compelling by doing so. You don't have to just use one, um, you know, you can use, you can kind of mix and match them. Um, right. Time-based scarcity, um, actual scarcity based on like quantity or inventory. Um, mm. All of that. Yeah, I did actually a, a t-shirt and a matching hoodie specifically for Memorial Day last year. Um, I was like, I'm, you know, just doing a small number of these. Um, but the, the larger narrative was like, it's around this, it's around Memorial Day, right? Where we're honoring um, you know, the, the people whose lives have been lost yeah. uh, as service members. And so there was a design that was very specific for that. And I was like, it's only going to be available for this period of time. Um, I did that for Veterans Day as well. Uh, I was like, hey, I made this red, white, and blue version of a shirt that I already had. 
Um, and it wasn't limited at all. I, you know, that wasn't part of the narrative at all. It was like, this is, I'm only going to have this up in my store for these days and then yeah. it's gone. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and that's cool because then, you know, maybe I do it again next year. Maybe it's the same design. Maybe it's a different design, you know, but I have those yeah. options because then it's not, oh, there's only 10 of these. And it's like, then you do it again next year. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah. You know what I yep. mean? Yeah. You don't want to yeah. do that to anybody. In fact, that's probably something we should touch on. Um, you know, Jesse was actually sharing at one of our inspo mornings that he had ordered, um, basically he got an email from an artist that he's a big fan of. And he was like, I only have so many of these left. And when Jesse got it, he was like, this is obviously print on demand. It's, you know, I washed it once and it fell apart and, you know, and he was pretty disappointed yeah. by that. And, you know, that you don't want to fib about that stuff. You know, it, if you're going to do something that's scarce in number, make sure it's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, don't be like, yeah, I'm only making 10 and then make another 10 later because the people who did support that particular piece are going to be pissed off. Yeah, for sure. Especially like, especially when you reopen, like that's something mm. that really grinds my gears. Like, listen, if you, you know, if you say there's 50 and you've actually got 60 in stock or something like that, and it's, and it's going to happen over a time window, like, you know, you're running it for like three weeks and then it's literally going to go away after that. You know, if your numbers are a little skewed, like sure, right. for forgiveness yeah. there. But if you yeah. run it for a month and then you keep running it and you're like 50 available, 50 available for like four months or some shit, like <sighs> no way are people going to buy that for long. They are going to be over that and, uh, and you're going to be outed as a you know, a liar, <laughs> a liar Dude, in your that marketing. Actually, you're a liar. That actually happened to me because originally when I was running my free plus shipping and handling funnel, I was going through these albums that I wasn't planning on reprinting, you know? Yeah. Yep. And I, um, I was like, yep, it's, and it's it still, it was, it was the limited edition. Um, and I didn't print more, but the ad was doing super well and I was like, gosh, you know, and that's what actually got me moving into, you know, my cold free plus shipping and handling funnel, which you can listen to a few episodes back, but um, from this past summer. But it's interesting because I ordered this new run. Um, I changed the sales page so that I didn't say it was the limited edition. Um, but, and I didn't say it was limited edition in the ad either. But it did say, I only have a few of these left. Yeah. And so I was trying to continue running that ad so the comments and reactions would continue to stack. But there was somebody that was like, I've been seeing that you only have a few of these for like a month. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, oh, snap, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I didn't even realize that that, that copy was in there, you know? Um, and so as I reordered the original version of that CD and not the limited edition, um, I realized how insincere that was coming across. So, uh, so yeah, I had to start the ad over and lose all that social proof, but it was far better than looking like my integrity was compromised, you know? Totally. So yeah. people will notice and they may call you out and then you look like a jerk face, which is yeah. no good. <laughs> you don't want to get caught with a, uh, don't want to get caught red handed in that way for sure. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's interesting, you know, and another play that I think works, works really well in this realm is an exclusivity style, um, type of scarcity that's my you know, favorite yeah a, su a subset of your fans are the only ones who are being exposed to a particular offer and maybe it's just for a certain amount of time right like you open the cart for something new and it's like hey you're my people i wanted you to be the first to hear about this and to get the first shot of it you know if you want one and this is where you can put in you know rarity you could be like i only got 20 of them so i wanted to make sure like you guys or you gals or whoever your tribe is heard about it first so you can get first dibs. You know, it's giving certain yeah. people, it's giving certain people the opportunity to get first dibs. And then you can say, listen, but after, you know, next Sunday, I'm opening it up to everybody and these are going to go fast. So if you want yours, here's your shot. Um, 
that works really, really well. And it makes people feel good. You know, if, right. uh, if you use this, for example, like if you run a Patreon or you've got a membership site, making those kinds of sales offers first to those people makes them feel like, oh, like I'm getting what I pay for to be in this, you know, this community that I'm in, uh, you know, Jack's taking care of me and making sure that like I get first dibs on the thing that, you know, he thinks I would, I would, I would dig. Um, right. That works really, really well. Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like a one-two punch of nurturing and uh, making a sales offer because uh, you've got people who are you know already they're already there they've already bought from you especially if they're in a membership like they're you know in a probably in a recurring space as far as uh, making purchases from you and you're nurturing them by saying like hey you're here and I recognize that so here's right. something cool if you dig it like first dibs. If you don't like all good, um, that can work a really, really, that can work a treat. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I do that with my members. Um, if I have merchandise coming out, uh, you know, depending on the tier that they're in, they get a discount code. So sometimes it's 20% off or 10% off, or, you know, maybe even more, depending on my margins on the item and the level of tier that they're at. So um, I'll be like, not only do, you know, is a ton of people not going to see this before you, but also you get this discount on it. Um, but also I have merchandise that's only for my members. They're, it's not on my regular oh, store. Yeah. Super it's sick. only for them. Yeah. And, it, you know, they're all kind of branded or designed around this like members only kind of concept. So, I mean, that's really great because you're talking about people who are willing to spend money on you, you know, for your membership every month. What are the chances that they're going to throw some more of their disposable income your way at that point? And it's high, you know? Yeah. So sometimes I'll just do very limited runs of stuff that is for members only um, so that they feel like, yo, I am in. No one else is going to get this unless they're a member. And so being a member, it's like, it's interesting because it's like, I'm paying for membership so I can buy things other people can't buy. It's like, yeah. they're paying money to pay money in a way, but you know, it's, it's cause they want that in, you know? Uh, so that's, that's something that if you are running, you know, a Patreon or a membership of some kind, like giving them access to exclusive merch in addition to exclusive content can also be a really cool strategy. You know, it's so interesting. Um, it's, it's really just a play on, you know, kind of like age old, like actual membership clubs, you know, you think about yeah. like country clubs and stuff like that. Actually, there's a, there's a hotel that just opened up, uh, near my hometown. It's like a, a nice fancy hotel and restaurant and they have like a, they have a rooftop bar and it's a thousand dollars a year to even be able to go to this rooftop bar. Oh, yeah. Dang. Crazy. Like I would never, um, <laughs> ever, ever, yeah, ever probably wouldn't, li rich probably, people. Would, probably wouldn't like the people that hang out there anyway, but, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but it's, the, it's the, that's, that's exactly what it is. It's like, Oh, those people are paying a thousand dollars a year just to be able to go to that place and spend, you know, money on drinks and expensive food. Like, because it's a status symbol and that's what, right. you know, that's what people do when it comes to, you know, membership, uh, membership merch. Um, I think another thing that I see a lot of artists do, which I always think is pretty cool is like on Patreon or membership sites, like maybe your top tier is something like, you know, once a year we'll come play at your house. And I often see artists be like, you know, this thousand dollar a month or $500 a month tier, there's only three slots to be in this. <laughs> and right. I was lot, like, holy mackerel. And, yeah. And a lot of that is probably because like, yeah, we can't travel more than that. You know, we can't do house shows more than three times a year or whatever it might be. Um, right. I think there's some real authenticity in that. Cause like most times, like, you know, when that's sold out, whether it's on Patreon or somewhere else, it's, you can't purchase it. And that's cool. Like that's authentic scarcity. Um, totally. Well, and on a smaller scale for that, and I know like, you know, live shows aren't happening right now, but I, dude, I was in so many fan clubs. I was in uh, the Death Cab for Cutie fan club. I was in the No Doubt fan club. And I did all of that because I wanted to get basically any band that had seated 
shows. A lot of shows are GA now, um, and and people because you know the artists like that energy. But um, for a long time, or if it's in an amphitheater, it'll still be like rows and seats, you know. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so I would be in those fan clubs because then I had access to the pre-sale. Yeah. And, you know, there's a certain number of rows that were reserved for the fan club. So I didn't have to worry about dealing with a scalper, buying on sub, on seat. What is it? Seat hub? I don't know. Stub um, hub. Stub, stub hub. hub. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's it. You know, <laughs> buying, you know, these scalper tickets at, you know, five times the price because I wanted to be in the front, you know. Um, yeah. So that was tickets. another cool thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, and that is something that they still do, you know, they'll still, sometimes it's just for the mailing list, but also if, if they have a membership, they'll be like, look, GA floor is going to be smaller this year and it's only going to this number of people. So, um, so that's another cool thing that when live events start back up, there's that, there's meet and greets, there's, you know, maybe there's a backstage level, um, which yeah. actually, I haven't opened the highest tiers of my membership yet, but that is a plan to be like, you can come backstage to one show, you know, of your choosing um, and stand side stage during the set, you know? So there's things like that um, that can, you know, really elevate and, and make it very exclusive and, and they feel very special, but it also endears you to them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, I think that that's, an awesome play. And I think like, here's, here's another one just to kind of dig into more of like how fans feel, um, you know, how fans feel when they're connected to you is, is one thing, but I think how they feel when connected to each other is another kind of scarcity play. And this kind of gets into like demand. Right. Um, and I see this right. play out often in, uh, I mean, you see this all the time in, in all sorts of markets and all sorts of industries, but like crowd psychology, when it kicks in, it's very, uh, it's really powerful. So if you've got a captive audience in some way and everyone is taking action on something, then holy crap, like no one's going to want to miss out. I've seen this play out on live streams in particular, like album launch live streams where someone's going live in the hours leading up to their record dropping or, you know, doing a world premiere kind of live stream and making sales offers during it. When the comments blow up with people being like, got my CD, got my merch, got my bundle. And that's just coming comment after comment, comment after comment after comment. Then you know, anyone who's not saying that is like, damn, dude, I gotta, I, I gotta click. One. Yeah. I gotta <laughs> click that link. Um, I want that. <laughs> exactly. It, it's, it's very real. Um, yeah. and I, I think another thing that plays into that is like when you're an artist and you're interacting with people as that's happening, shouting them out and being like, thank you so much. I even see this with like tip jar on YouTube, right? Um, mm, yeah. Uh, like YouTube lives, um, even like Facebook stars, yeah, you know? super chat or whatever. Yeah. Su super chat. Exactly. Um, going and you know, people give donations and, you know, as an artist, if you go out of your way to be like, Hey, thank you. So, and so like, I, I massively appreciate your support that makes that person feel good, but it also makes the person next to them be like, I need to, uh, I'll drop five yeah, bucks. It's like FOMO at its best. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they noticed me. Um, yeah. You know, and it's not manipulative. It's just like, that's, you know, that's what no, you do to make. No, it's something they it's, want. You're yeah. going to give it to them. Exactly. I mean, that's it, something else we talked about at Inspo a different day. Um, I've been digging a lot. Sorry to nerd out, but I've been digging a lot into Dead Mouse's stuff because Joel and I have been talking a lot on Clubhouse. And so, it, and I, I wasn't necessarily a, a fan of Dead Mouse prior to this, and I didn't know a lot about his ecosystem, but... I realized like how deep and crazy his fan base is. Yeah. Um, like he started a, we started a room uh, where we were all changing our profile pictures to ghosts and stuff. And then, and he would just had ghost sounds running all night and he like put on some like haunted house soundtrack and there at any given point would be a hundred people and they're just sitting and listening to it because he started it. It was so crazy to me. So yeah. I was like, this fan base is crazy. And you know, funnel hacker I am, I was like, all right, I need to go like run down what the hell all of this is. Like, where did this come from? 
Um, so I started digging into all of his stuff and something that he does that is super cool that I am totally going to rip off and I'm just going to admit it right now <laughs> is <laughs> he has these pins that he sends out with various orders. Um, I think it's like, I don't know if there's a certain bar, like you have to spend a certain amount and you get a collector pin, but there are basically these pins that are, um, you know, some of them are more rare and some of them are more common and you get them in the mail and like, that's cool, right? You like collect them all like a Pokemon card kind of situation. But what I thought was really cool was that if you go on Reddit or, you know, any of these places, there are people that are like, hey, I have two of these and I want the Australian flag one. Does anyone want to trade? And you start getting these conversations going oh, between yeah. fans that are about you, not even with you. So they already have a relationship with you, but now they have a relationship with each other. Yeah. And, you know, Paramore used to do that. They would... They, you know, would have these communities coming in on Live Journal, which was way back in the day. Oh, yeah. But yep. these communities would come together in the comments section of the Paramore Live Journal, and then they would go to shows together. And so it just, even if someone was kind of lukewarm on it before, now they're hip to it because they have a friend who will go with them, you know? So anytime that you can, you know, bring in these scarcity or, you know, rare things, you start getting the community talking to each other. Um, that's even happened in my Facebook group. There's a guy who has, I don't know where he found them, honestly. There's CDs that are in versions that I haven't printed in 10 years. And he found some that even were autographed, like back from when, I don't even know where he found them. But, um, you know, he found some on eBay and he went on Amazon and he found a used one there or something. Um, and he posted in the Facebook group, like his whole display of all of these albums that he'd gathered. And he was like, I almost have all of them, you know, because when you're an artist that's, you know, had a, a while of DIY in front of you, you're not like a label product. You print things in different formats, depending on what you can afford at the time. And so, um, and he wanted every last little version. And then the community started being like, where'd you get that? I'm going to go find, you know? And so they're yeah. having a conversation and I didn't have to do anything, you know? Um, and they're binding with each other, not just around me, but to each other. And I think that is, you know, a really, it's just a really great kind of thing to encourage through these types of products uh, because then your community is getting stronger and your advocacy stage is being supported there. Your I was referral just, stage. Yes, yeah. I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. It supports You're, that higher echelon of the buddy system. Yeah, totally. Um, we've been working with, with one of our IndieXers on inside his membership, building essentially like not street teams, but what we're calling communities, which is, you know, mm. basically like allowing people to create little pods of their friends and family and other fans in the area to do oh, like cool locale based. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. To do cool stuff together. Um, and it's really just in its infancy. So I don't have anything, I don't have anything cool to report on it yet, but, <laughs> um, but once I do, I'll, I'll certainly circle back to it here on the show, but I've done that before too, where, yeah. um, if I'm coming out with a release, I'll have a listening party kind of thing where I'm live. Um, I think it was on Stitcher when I did this, I Dude, I'm aging myself so Throwback. hard in this thing. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely dating myself. But, um, but like I went live on Stitcher and they were all going live, but they were gathering in one place. And then yeah. the music was being, you know, broadcast in these, only in these specific places. And it allowed me, you know, back then there was still street teams going on and whatever, but um, it allowed me to kind of help them bond together, even if they never would have met each other otherwise. That stuff is cool. I love that. Yeah, totally. And you're, and that's exactly like you, what you were saying. When you create cool offers and you, uh, here I go on my offer soapbox, when you create cool offers and you use, you know, the principles of scarcity in your selling, um, it kind of naturally starts to occur, you know, it builds up in your right. ecosystem little by little. And, uh, 
you know, this doesn't require like dedicated campaign work, at least not at first. You can get into that later and, you know, start to develop it out further, but it will happen naturally so long as you've got kind of, you know, these things that eventually could become collectible. Yeah. It's something to think about when you are developing stuff out. Like what, what opportunity am I giving my fans to connect with each other, you know? Yeah. Uh, and not just with me. So, um, and you can do that even with a small fan base. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be giant, you know? Uh, you could have maybe 25 people who have all reached a certain level of LTV and, you know, you can help them bond together in the fact that they are, you know, mega, mega supportive of everything you do. Um, and then they'll kick it off for you, you know, totally, uh, yeah. and it'll grow and be contagious and all of those things. So we talked, yeah. we talked, yeah, we talked about a lot of that, like, particularly with like developing products for your brand. I think it was episode 154, uh, where okay. we talked about like creating products that are quintessentially you. Um, right. So I'll, I'll link to that here in the show too, just so that you guys can go back and like dig in. If any of this talk of scarcity is like, okay, cool, but now how do I make a product? You know, that's that's where you can get into like, you know, offer ideation and creating stuff that actually fits, you know, who you are. Um, Absolutely. I think that's, that's kind of the natural, like, you know, maybe we're looking at this from like a 30,000 foot view of like, deep dive into selling principles. And now it's like, okay, I need to go back to actually figure out what I'm going to sell, whether it's a physical product, a digital product down the line an NFT, whatever you, <laughs> whatever it is that you're coming up with, you've got some tools in your toolkit now to, you know, figure out how to talk about it and how to hone in the messaging. Now it's just about putting together a, a badass offer that is right for your fans, whether it's a small fan base, like you said, Corinne, or a massive fan base. Um, it doesn't really matter. Right. I couldn't say it better. So if you're worried about NFTs, but you haven't done all that stuff, maybe try that stuff first. <laughs> yeah. So next week, I'm very excited. Um, I'm pretty sure it's next week. We have a very cool guest coming. We're trying to bring guests in as much as we can. Um, or maybe it's the week after. Is it the week after, I think, Jeff? I think, it's, I think it's next week. Okay. Well, we're going to figure it out. Yeah, I think it's next week as well. So... We're going to have some cool stuff to talk about. Um, but in the meantime, get off those NFTs and get into making some cool collectible stuff that you can do right now without having to mint anything or create a wallet. You know, just make something that's cool. And again, like Jack said, if you need to brainstorm about it, 154 is where you want to go. So that's all we have for this week, Indies. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And we'll see you next week on Creative Juice.